evening and welcome to Garden Hour. This is the time at which we are here to share information about all things yards and gardens and to answer questions that you may have. I'm Rhoda Burrows. I'm an extension horticulture specialist and I will be your host tonight. Our panelists tonight are Paul Johnson, former SDSU Extension Weed Specialist, I guess not quite former yet. And did I hear you were going to be talking about some new formulations of Roundup tonight, Paul? And Paul is finding his video. Uh, that would be... Uh... <laughs> That would be what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about also identifying some grasses in lawns. Uh, uh, they kind of go hand in hand. Been a lot of questions lately about, okay, do I put on my crabgrass killer or, or do I got to do something else? And we'll kind of sort those out uh, a little bit tonight and then talk about, yeah, uh, we're going to call it can them and confuse them. Uh, with uh, different roundups tonight. Yeah. Second of all, we'll have Christine Light, our SDSU Extension Consumer Horticulture Specialist. And Christine, what are you bringing for us to look at tonight? Well, I'm going to show a garden visitor that I've noticed this week and also just be talking about how to manage some of those plants that have grown out of control as we've been waiting to put them in our gardens. Sounds like a very pertinent topic. Uh, I will be talking about uh, a little bit about the killing temperatures that we may or may not have had in the past week and, and what temperatures blossoms can, of fruit trees can really withstand and, and whether you might or might not have received any damage in this past week. And, and finally, we will have John Ball, last but certainly not least. John is a SDSU Extension Forestry Specialist and South Dakota Forest Health Specialist. And John, what are you going to be bringing for us tonight? Well, I'm going to talk about the compressed season we've had where almost everything is in bloom at once. And so going over some of the plants and flowers and then also our bug season's been compressed. So there's a lot of treatments that are coming up or right on top of us now. And I'll discuss a few of those as well. Sounds great. Just a reminder, if you have a question, you can put it either in the chat or in the Q&A box. If you put it in the Q&A, we can kind of mark it and keep track of it. The chat's a little bit harder for us to keep track of, but we will uh, try to keep an eye on that. And also keep an eye on the chat for yourselves because we often will uh, put in references that you can, you can link to if, if you're interested in a particular topic. So take it away, Paul. Well, good evening, everybody, and we're uh, glad to be here. As Rhoda mentioned, uh, uh, after 39 years, I'm going to uh, retire here at the end of the month, uh, but wanted to visit with you all one last time, and uh, we're going to uh, talk about uh, or some lawn issues and uh, look at that um, and uh, kind of go from there. Um, you know, I think the uh, question always is, uh, can lawn issues be fixed? A lot of them can. Some of them are a lot more difficult. Um, you know, here we're looking at some nice bluegrass and uh, looks good. Here we're looking at uh, what I call cheap lawn seed. If you go to uh, Kmart or whatever, we've got fescue and uh, um, our regular uh, dune grass uh, in there uh, or bluegrass and it's looking good. But the problem is with these temperature extremes when we're cool, we can see the fescue um, is quite a bit taller to dune grass or uh, bluegrass isn't growing as uh, fast um, and you're going to have that. And then you get in the other part of the season and uh, uh, the bluegrass will grow faster and the other will kind of just sit there. And 
So a lot of people don't like that. And the main key here is you would have to basically use glyphosate. And we're gonna say glyphosate tonight because as you'll see later, we don't wanna talk Roundup anymore. But we'd use glyphosate to spray it out and have to start over. Another one you'll see is invasion. Here, uh, a fine uh, bent grass is kind of uh, invading in patches um, into the bluegrass. Again, here, we would look at using glyphosate to take out those uh, patches and then reseed in and make sure when you're buying the seed that you do have um, a bluegrass, pure bluegrass to look at. One of the other things we see a lot this time of the year is um, what I call winter kill, or it could be a chemical spill. And to be honest, I know this is a chemical spill. Uh, and the chemical in this case was gas, was spilled on this lawn and last year. And we can see it's starting to uh, get washed down into the soil and break down. And we're seeing some uh, small uh, bluegrass uh, coming into there. Now, <clears throat> if we look out there, and I'm sure some of our other experts can tell us, the lilacs are blooming. So what does that mean it's time for? Well, if you think about it, it is time for us to get our crabgrass preventers on before this little plant uh, raises its ugly head because the preventers kill the seed as they're germinating. Even if we look to the side here, there's a couple little plants just starting, uh, those preventers will not do that. And so now is the time uh, as soon as possible to uh, get the uh, uh, crabgrass preventers on. This plant here in the center would even be too big for our post-emergence products. Normally they say three, four leaf or up to uh, joining. And uh, the small ones they'd work fine on but this one uh, for the most part would be getting too late and we'd have a uh, poor control. And so we don't wanna uh, look at that. And uh, once the old uh, crabgrass gets to this stage, um, it's already started to seed out. Uh, the only thing you can do with this uh, is literally pull it and remove it spraying it, you'd just be doing for revenge to make you feel good, but you wouldn't be doing anything to help you out. Now, the more difficult things we see are the perennials in our bluegrass lawn and uh, make for the crabgrass preventers will do uh, nothing for them. In this case here, we're gonna look at uh, uh, quack grass tonight. And when you're going to ID or send in for an ID, taking a picture over the top of the lawn is very difficult to ID off from. Uh, what you need is a picture like this with the whole plant so we can see the different parts. And we're gonna go through some of them here now quickly just to uh, show you how we ID uh, different plants. In this case, we're looking at the oracles. And the arrow here shows the oracles on uh, this quack grass. Uh, if it would have been brome grass, there would be no oracles. And so that's part of the ID. But again, this is where the leaf attaches to the stem. And we're looking at that part, very important to see and uh, uh, being able to ID. Now, uh, rhizomes. When we have perennials and uh, brome and quack have as good a rhizomes as any, 
That's this underground chute that is moving. And this is why when we uh, spray an area out, we need to go a ways beyond the actual plant because if these rhizomes are just coming up, they can be, they will go a ways and then they will turn and come up the, to the ground, up um, to the surface and start a new plant. And if that plant is small, uh, we could end up spraying out the quack and then have an edge all the way around where new quack plants will be coming. And so here we've got a rhizome. We got a small one down here. And uh, that uh, only happens on perennials. Uh, things like foxtail and crabgrass do not have those. Um, also, the collar on the plant is behind where it, the leaf attaches. And we can see here with the uh, quack grass, there's quite a few hairs on that stem. Uh, other uh, grasses may not have any hairs. And so that's part of the ID process too. And then here's a better uh, picture showing the whole collar uh, with the stem removed. And the collar basically goes from here where I'm pointing up to here. And the, the collar can be wide as this one is. Some of them are narrower. And so that uh, comes into play here too, as we are, are uh, doing our ID. Now, um, I wanna bring, bring to you some real concern I have about products and how they are changing. As we have maybe heard uh, a little over a year ago, uh, Bear, who owns the uh, product name Roundup, uh, said they will be removing all glyphosate products from the market uh, because of concerns over lawsuits that they feel are not uh, relevant. And I have a tendency to agree by all of our toxicity uh, data and uh, looking at Roundup. Now, this is a new product just on the market. Market. It's called Roundup for Lawns. And you gotta read the fine print because this Roundup does not have any glyphosate in it. It is made up of MCPA, Quinclorac, which is for crabgrass post-emergence. MCPA is for broadleaves. Uh, also, it has dicamba in here. Um, some of you have heard about the problems with soybeans and drift from dicamba. And then also sulfentrazone. And those are the products. And yes, you could spray this on your lawn, but if there would also be uh, glyphosate in there, it would kill your lawn. These products will not, but it is just like a Trimat product or a Weed Be Gone product where you can have drift uh, with these uh, products. Now, let's go to the next slide here. This one is called Roundup Custom for Aquatic and Terrestrial Use, which means if we go down a little further, it's a broad spectrum post-emergence herbicide for aquatic and industrial, turf, ornamental, forestry, roadside, utility right away, uh, select crop and other listed terrestrial weed control. If we look down in the ingredient line here, we will see this is made up of 53.8% glyphosate. If you spray this product on your turf or lawn, it's going to kill it. That's what the old products all did and uh, are very useful for renovating lawns. If we lose glyphosate out of lawn for that type of use, 
if you want to reseed a lawn, it'll mean you will have to rototill it up and basically fallow it for a year to kill all the uh, rhizomes and other roots that may be in the soil. And uh, we would be going, uh, uh, we haven't had to do that this way um, since the early 70s where, when uh, Roundup first come on the market. So when you go to your garden center or uh, your local uh, hardware store or whoever you're buying your chemicals from, you got to read the label or you're going to have some real problems. Also, there is Roundup products now out there that say Roundup for quick kill. If you look at that one, it will have glyphosate, but it also has diquat, which uh, to me on the toxicity level is a lot more toxic but it's very proper, uh, popular with uh, people because uh, within a day or two, it's going to show activity. And that's the diquat part just burning, um, where the glyphosate is very slow acting and uh, uh, takes two to three weeks for that plant to totally dry up and die down. And so, consequently, um, make sure for the future you realize Roundup is going to become a name for several different products, just like Weed Be Gone or Trimec is by different companies at this point. And so just wanted to bring you up to date on that because that's going to be happening more and more in the future. And uh, with that, that's kind of what I wanted to share tonight. And uh, sorry for the slow fire up, but uh, hopefully we got everybody covered. All right, thank you, Paul. Uh, always, we always say read the lab label and, and even more so now, make sure you know what you're buying. Christine. I'll let you go ahead. All right, I'll get things rolling. There we are. Well, um, last time we, we saw everybody, we were talking about covering your plants and making sure that plant material was protected. Um, as I was heading, as Saturday was set to turn into Sunday, I did get my plants covered. I used old bed sheets and towels and things that I could just wash and rinse and reuse and had that draped over all of my garden beds. Um, for those of you who use plastic, we had talked about, you know, making sure you had a pocket of air so that plant material wasn't um, touching that plastic and you didn't see as many freezer burn symptoms. So, um, I'm hoping that everyone's plants made it through, but even with the cover, I wanted to point out that our, uh, our warm season plants, such as the peppers and basil that I've already had out because I just couldn't wait, I did see some, some browning, some light yellowing and discoloration and tissue damage. So while the, the frost cover protected these plants from a complete kill, um, I am still seeing signs of damage and you might be noticing similar symptoms in your garden. It can take several days for that tissue damage to truly develop and show. Um, with both um, the pepper on the left and the basil on the right, I am paying attention to the growing point. So that central point at the top of the plant where all of the new growth is gonna be emerging. So far on both of these plants, that's looking pretty good. So I expect we'll continue to see new growth and I'll likely just pull off those, those old damaged leaves and see how these plants do. If you have plants in your garden that have, you know, severe over half the leaves are damaged or you're starting to see blackening or any sort of decay, it might be, um, it might be time to, you know, see how they do by the weekend and then head to the garden center and get some new transplants versus delaying your garden produce even further due to freeze damage. And I know that's frustrating, but hopefully we're out of the woods for the season, but I'm going to knock on my wood desk right now as I say that. Um, 
On the other hand, some of my cool season loving plants that were in my garden, my, my cool season annuals, my pannul, um, pansies and alyssum, the Swiss chard and the arugula, they looked great. I didn't even throw a cover on my arugula greens and they looked completely happy the next day. So, um, you know, we, we see a spectrum of plant response with our freezing temperatures, but just be patient. And if it's just a few leaves, you should be able to remove them. And that's a good segue to what on earth are we going to do with all of these plants that we're waiting to get out in the gardens, they've been sitting in our homes or our sunny windows for far too long. And we need to get them out, but they're looking tall and leggy and stretched out. Um, one technique you can use is pinching. And the, the plant that's circled in orange, that is a snapdragon that has not been pinched. You can see the growing point, similar to what we just discussed on the last slide. And the purple circle shows where we have removed that growing point down to what I'm gonna call the third node. So a node is the point on your stem where you have new leaves emerging. And by removing that growing point, that signals to the plant to send new tiny shoots at the leaf axle. And that is where the base of the leaf meets the main stem. And what we're gonna see happen here is two new sets of shoots are gonna emerge on these snapdragons. These snapdragons are growing in our greenhouse at SDSU. We're gonna be using them for cut flower trials and we want multiple stems. So not only was this controlling plant height as I'm waiting to put these outdoors, but it is also gonna give us multiple stems of blooms versus one long stem. Um, sometimes when you bring your plants home from the garden center, you might notice that they're looking a little floppy um, or they've been in the garden center too long or they've been crowded together. And oftentimes our garden center employees will also go through and, and pinch plants to encourage branching and keep things more compact as they're holding on to them before you purchase them. So this is a technique that you can use um, to kind of reset those plants and encourage lots of branching and have those plants fill in the garden. And just to show you two examples, um, the, the pansies on the left and the sweet alyssum on the right, these are both transplants that I put out in the garden. And when I put them out, I wanted to minimize transplant shock. It was quite early in the season. I pinched off all of the blooms and um, both of these plants were planted several weeks ago in the garden and they've already set new blooms and have started to branch. So this can also be a technique to minimize transplant shock. And again, encourage branching so those plants spread out and fill the spaces in your garden versus becoming tall and flopping over. And you're just gonna have me for a few minutes tonight. So I'm gonna end with just a fun anecdote. Um, in the last couple of days, we have noticed that a pair of chipping sparrows has started to visit our garden. And at first I was getting really concerned that they were gonna build a nest in my garden, but quickly realized that they were very interested in the coconut fiber lining that we have in this, um, in this bag basket. And this is actually an egg crate. Last year it had an egg plant planted in it because I enjoy a good pun. But this chipping sparrow has just been taking those fibers and they're headed off to build their nests. So um, I guess just a nice reminder to pay attention to who else is taking shop in your garden. I know the hummingbirds are out. They've been visiting our feeder. Unfortunately, my scarlet rudder beans aren't blooming and providing any forage just yet, but will be later in the season. And um, just want to give a shout out to everyone who attended Garden Discovery Festival last um, on Sunday. It was great to see you and keep an eye out for some more summer events that are going to be coming up. I expect you to be showing some baby birds in a, in a future oh. garden hour now. <laughs> I was going to say, in theory, they keep flying away. So I don't think the nest <laughs> is going to show up in our garden, but stay tuned. That could change. <laughs> OK. Um, and now I'm getting the wrong one, just like Paul did, right there. Uh, oh, no, you actually had it right the first time. I had it, it right great. the first time. It looked great. Okay. It looked great to us. <laughs> All right. You never All know. <laughs> Someday I'm just going to sit down and figure this out and get it straight. But 
anyway, um, Evan, can you pull up the results of that poll? Sure thing. And I don't know if he'll let, yep. Okay, so some of you, about a fifth of you had damage, but just on your very tender plants. And it looks like a number of you uh, escaped it altogether, which is wonderful. Um, I am going to talk about some frost damage that might not be as obvious as dead leaves uh, from, from cool temperatures. And we've got several examples here. Uh, first of all, with a strawberry blossom, uh, this is what a normal blossom should look like. And uh, uh, you see the black center on that blossom underneath it. So if you see black in the center or in the, in the pistil of the plant, uh, that means it, that it got some frost damage. And sometimes you actually have to open up the flower, cut it, cut it uh, uh, lengthwise and look inside to see. Um, sometimes it's just a black thread of damage, but if you're curious, otherwise you just wait and see if you actually got fruit set and, and hopefully you had enough pollinators to get fruit set. Uh, the pear and apple on the right are an example of frost damage that that you can observe even when you get normal fruit set. Uh, this is a uh, result of some frost damage early in the spring and killed those outside epidermal cells on the fruit, uh, not all the way around the apple, but kind of what was sticking out the most was the blossom end there. Um, so if you see that later in the season, you could say, oh, that was probably because of our cold temperatures. And then on the left, cat facing on tomatoes uh, can be uh, caused by frost. It can also be caused by uh, things like herbicide damage. So, uh, but those are some possibilities. Um, I'm not gonna <laughs> expect you to read all this, uh, but just to let you know that people have figured out what Temperatures, apples, and other kinds of fruit trees pretty much follow the same temperature pattern where they can take various temperatures without damage, even down to 15 degrees when the, when the bud is just starting to expand up to full bloom. We start to see a little bit of the damage at 28 degrees, but it has to get all the way down to 25 degrees before you have 90% kill. So you even still have 10% of your blossoms left at 25 degrees. And uh, with a lot of fruit trees that can, especially with apples that set so many more fruit than they actually need for full harvest, uh, you might get 90% blossom kill and still have 30 or 40 or 50% of your normal crop. So, uh, just, just something to keep in mind if you were nervous about temperatures uh, this past weekend. We see the same thing with buds, with uh, grape buds. And uh, I put this in to show that even when you have third or fourth leaf, so when that shoot started to expand, uh, it can still take it down to uh, 28 degrees, is kind of the temperature at which we start to see some damage on the, on the more sensitive plants. And uh, that's because those cells often have, have sugars and other things that act has a little bit of an antifreeze. So uh, just, just for your knowledge. Um, and finally, I wanted to put up this uh, map. You may remember if you were on a couple of weeks ago, uh, that I put up a similar map and pretty much all this area here was in orange, which was 59 degrees or warmer. And yesterday we were back down to uh, in the 50s and this is four inch soil depth uh, under bare soil. And this is across the state. So uh, at 45 degrees, you can plant all cool season crops. So of course you could have those in now. 
You kind of want to wait till 60 degrees to put in your corn, beans, and cucumbers. And we have a few places, Sioux Falls and so forth, that and Pierre held to that, but uh, it might be a little early for, for some of the rest of the state. And then squash, pumpkins, tomatoes, and peppers, <laughs> as, as Christine mentioned, if you're waiting to hold those off, uh, you're, you're uh, going to have to wait a little bit longer before the soil's warm enough for those. Um, and there was a question that came in that is unrelated, uh, well, mostly unrelated. Uh, and that was, I had an infestation of yellow striped cucumber beetles last year. It was no fun and I pulled the plants. With, unless you actually had wilted uh, from bacteria wilt, I wouldn't suggest pulling the plants, but I'm assuming that might have been the case. I was told that I need to sit out about three years before trying to grow more cukes because the larvae would be in the soil. I am not quite sure uh, where that advice came from, but uh, cucumber beetles mostly, it's mostly the striped ones that we're concerned with. Uh, because they are the ones that come out earlier in the season and can do the most damage. And they generally overwinter as adults. So they'll come out after you've planted your squash and pumpkins and cucumbers. And they'll come out in the spring as adults and lay eggs. And then the, the larvae can actually feed on the roots, but it's said that they don't really do too much damage. What we often will see is feeding damage on those real baby plants. Um, if you have a lot of cucumbers, you can actually uh, have enough damage to set the plants back quite a ways or even kill the, the plants. So keep a watch for them right after you transplant and be ready either with an insecticide or another alternative is to use a row cover. Um, but there's no reason for, for the reason of cucumber beetles uh, to not pull, put cucumbers in that same spot. We do recommend waiting three years for some of the other diseases that can hit cucurbits. So that's probably where the advice kind of all came together, uh, but you don't have to worry about the larvae living for three years in the soil. With that, uh, we had one question if Paul was still on the line about what you would recommend for uh, crabgrass prevention. Did we, did we cover that one? Okay, I guess uh, when I look at that, there's a lot of good uh, crabgrass products out there. Um, you know, this new Roundup one has quinclorac in. It has short residual and post-emergence activity uh, if we're at that point. But preventer-wise, I'm kind of traditionalist. Uh, to me, I either like the trifluralin or the pendimethalin. Uh, they are an old chemistry, uh, but they have the longest residual. And the most common question I get at the state fair is that my crabgrass uh, material didn't last long enough. That's why we don't recommend putting it on right away in the spring until we get to the point of loilocks blooming because that's a good indicator of soil temperatures and when we're going to start having uh, those uh, seeds germinating. And so I like as long as we can get a product to last and still uh, provide uh, good control. The thing with both of those yellows, uh, and, and why I say yellow, they were originally, the pendimethalin was a yellow dye that was used and found out it had uh, activity and as far as weed control, but both those products need about a half inch of moisture to get them activated. 
so ideally you want to put them on uh, when you know it's going to rain in the next day or two uh, put it on ahead of that and you get the moisture if you don't get uh, 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 moisture within a week if you can irrigate and put a half inch or so on would be good to make them uh, work. Some of the other products don't need as much rain, but they don't last near as long. All right. And I think that uh, means that it's time to to talk about the trees that are going to be over those lawns right now. John, take it away. And you're listed as Rhoda Burroughs. No wonder I was confused. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how that happened, but I saw the same thing. So I, I can understand your confusion. And uh, yeah, I, you know, ha, oh, geez. I, you know, you read any, anytime you hear the word dicamba, think death uh, because that's a great tree killer now again uh, the uh, dosage determines the poison but still a lot of these are just great tree killers or stunters or something else so ju just be cautious people read and follow label directions and if they say don't use them near trees i would go to the point if you see a tree don't use it uh, because a lot of them just say, well, don't use them within the drip line, but roots can go much farther. And I'm not saying you can't carefully use a lot of these, but, uh, you know, I get calls every summer and I go out and look at trees and shrubs every year. And, uh, you know, the problem is a misapplication of a herbicide. I want to point that out, a misapplication of a herbicide. So the read and follow label directions, which I think all of us have said several times. Well, anyway, let's look at the good stuff. Where are we at growing degree days? And we're actually picking it up. Soil temperatures got a little cooler, apparently. But uh, we're at 420 growing degree days in Sioux Falls right now. It, it, it's like the last week or two, the light came on and it decided to be spring. And we actually got ahead of Rapid City where behind, we were behind it. Even Aberdeen is catching up the uh, tundra of the north. Uh, they had a real slow start this year. But what's interesting is you're seeing things in bloom that normally might be weeks apart. But now we're days apart as the growing degree days in which they bloom have just been compressed more than what we typically see. So enjoy it while you got it. Uh, the spring snow crab apples are in full bloom in Brookings right now and just a spectacular display. The, I'll be honest, they're not my favorite plant. Uh, reason being they don't produce fruit, which might be the reason they're your favorite plant. But I like the fruit on crab apples. It does provide that winter interest as well as uh, food for wildlife. But if you say, I don't want fruit, this is one that doesn't have fruit. Now, by the way, it's an old cultivar. If we have moisture during the year, not only doesn't have fruit in the fall, it doesn't have leaves in the fall either because it's very susceptible to apple scab. Um, and I've seen trees that uh, a couple of years ago when we had the uh, above average rains, by August, there was maybe half a dozen leaves on a tree as well. But the Buckeyes are in bloom as well right now. And I took this picture of the Autumn Splendor Buckeye. If you're uh, uh, from Minnesota watching us, or uh, this is your tree. It was developed at the University of Minnesota and it's widely available, relatively easy to propagate apparently. But uh, it's, it's in bloom right now. The thing I like about this tree, is it does have the flowers of the Buckeye, but it doesn't produce the Buckeyes. They're relatively few and far between, maybe five on a plant, despite the fact they have a lot of flowers. So if you say, well, I don't want Buckeyes because I don't want a lot of the Buckeyes, uh, this is your plant. And another one's out there is the Ruby Red, also known as the Red Horse Chestnut. This it always blooms a little behind the uh, Buckeyes. Horse chestnuts tend to flower a little bit later in our area. And so I took this picture on Monday in Mitchell and you can see the flowers are just beginning to open. In fact, the leaves are just beginning to open on this plant and, and incredibly attractive flowers. And it's not a tall tree either. Uh, 
they get about uh, 20 feet tall. So if you're looking for a little horse chestnut in your yard, uh, this is a real nice one. Um, and what's just blooming now across the state is our claim to fame, South Dakota's claim to fame, and that is the Purple Leaf Sand Cherry. This was an introduction by N. E. Hansen, one of the early plant explorers from South Dakota. And I remember reading his name, because this is a plant that's popular across the United States, reading his name as the originator of this plant. And it was always Annie Hansen from North Dakota. Uh, apparently they can't get the states right, but he's actually from South Dakota uh, and released an awful lot of plant material out there. And this is one of them. By the way, very fragrant little plant. Uh, not really any fruit to it, but it's an attractive little purple leaf plant with pretty flowers right now that, like I say, are fragrant. And one that is spectacular right now are the red buds. Uh, I took this picture at Macquarie Gardens on Sunday during our garden festival. And of course, I had to stop and show this tree to people. But every branch was lined with these small little lavender pink pea-like flowers to it. And that really is a showstopper. Uh, if you get a northern strain, a northern strain redbud, they're hardy for most of the state, at least south of 212. Uh, our biggest one's actually in spearfish. We have them growing in uh, uh, pier. We certainly have them growing in Brookings. I took that picture uh, in Brookings. And you get down to Sioux Falls, Mitchell, and Yankton, and they, they're really spectacular. So if you're looking for a small tree, about 20 feet, uh, that really is a showstopper in the spring. And I'll admit that's its only season. Uh, uh, Eastern Redbud is just one of those nice choices. And of course, as Paul mentioned, the common lilacs are in bloom right now. And I took that picture in Mitchell on uh, Monday as I was passing through on my way to the hills. And our common lilacs are in full bloom. Now, I'm getting calls from people or people have contacted me over the years and say, you know what, I'm allergic to lilacs. No, you're not. All right, lilacs have pretty big sticky pollen. All right. Why? Because they expect an insect to pollinate them. They are not wind pollinated. The only way you could say, well, I'm sneezing because uh, of the pollen from the lilacs is if you're rub rubbing your noses right in the individual petals. And by the way, people will notice that. Uh, now, there are some people that really react to the fragrance. Isn't that interesting? There are some people who are going to get those kind of uh, allergy symptoms by just a vase of them in the house, but it's not from the pollen. If you're starting to sneeze now that the lilacs are in bloom, there's a lot of things out there, but one culprit is actually our oaks. Uh, they're in bloom right now too, but they're wind pollinated and it's the wind pollinated plants that really drive our uh, plant allergies uh, because very small pollen, uh, which of course we react to, or some of us react to, uh, to it with a hay fever-like condition. So, you know, don't go out and blame the lilacs right now. Uh, blame your burr oaks out there is one of our woody plants that uh, cause the problem. And right now too, if you look at your blue spruce, right on the tip are these little kind of purplish or blue uh, little bulbs to them. And those are cones. Those are the male cones. The female cones are found up in the plants. Those are the big woody cones that produce the seeds. These are the male cones. And in about another week, you're going to shake those and they'll release this little dust. Now, by the way, it's a fairly heavy pollen. So it doesn't travel very far and you're not allergic to your blue spruce either. Well, what's some other events coming up? Uh, fairly quickly now, we're going to see Emerald Ash Borer emerging. They're all in their little resting stage still, but they're beginning to look just like adults. And they're going to sit for a couple of days, but they're almost right on target at about 550 growing degree days, about when black locust blooms. And black locust is just starting to put its leaves on, which it does just before it flowers. And so I think we're on schedule to have this insect uh, flying 
about the uh, first week of June, in fact, first day of June. And remember, if you cut down an infested ash tree this winter and you've just stacked the wood there, the adults are still going to come out of it. So it's a good time to get rid of any ash wood uh, in Lincoln, Minnehaha, Turner County that you cut down from an infested tree because they're going to be re releasing them here uh, relatively quickly. And I'm out in the hills right now. You don't have mountain, uh, emerald ash borer, but you got the little cousin to uh, mountain pine beetle. And those are the pine engraver beetles. And uh, the Forest Service and ourselves are finding the populations going up again. Uh, this insect reacts to drought. You get uh, uh, the previous year, the precipitation was about three fourths normal, which it has been for the last couple of years. That weakens the tree so these little beetles can go from just feeding on fallen branches of that to actually feeding on trees. And so we're getting some of those discolored trees in the hills, pockets of them. It's not mountain pine beetle. It's due to the pine engraver beetle. And right now, if you go out any fallen trees or if you cut some trees and left the pine branches on the ground, you'll see all the sawdust on them. And that sawdust is the adults, the adults overwinter in trees and also just in the duff layer. So they're just in the soil. And right now they're out flying around and they're looking for something to feed on. The spring adults like to attack fresh down wood. So any broken branches, anything that somebody cut and laid down on the ground, like on a thinning, that's their favorite spot to be. And when you cut these open, yep, there they are. Uh, took that picture today of one of the adults was quite surprised that it pulled the bark away, but it's burling in there right now. And with this one, uh, you get one male and about three females and each of the females has her own tunnel going away. And they'll very quickly be laying eggs along their gallery. Now those eggs are gonna hatch in about 40 days from now, uh, the adults, the new adults are going to come out. Now the new adults, if there's not fresh down wood and this wood often dries very quickly, those adults are going to attack standing stress trees. So right now the adults are going into any fresh down material, it has to be fresh though, because they have to feed on that inner bark with the sugars. But that's going to dry out in about the next, what, 40 or 50 days. And so the adults that come out aren't going to be able to go back into this. Now we might get a storm and more downed wood, uh, and they'll be happy to stay in that. But if not, they're going to go to the trees. Now, the worst thing you can do is do this. If right now in April and May, you cut brush and stack it like this, What's going to happen? That's going to be very attractive to that first generation of adults, but it's going to dry out by the time the new adults, the next generation emerges, and they're going to go to trees. If you've piled this brush up after the show tonight, get out there, spread it around, all right, lop and scatter. So it dries out quickly enough that, it, that the larvae that are going to be in there do not survive to maturity. Stack like this, it'll stay just moist enough to allow them to survive. And the last two years, we found creating these small brush piles in the spring, not in the winter, not in the fall, but in the spring, is really helping to drive this little epidemic. And again, once the rains come back, it will not be a problem. Well, some other things. Oh my gosh, oyster shell scale is going crazy right now. I've been looking at a lot of ash and these people are saying, oh, it's got to have emerald ash borer. It's not leafing out very well. Or they're aspen trees. And this one was not leafing out very well. And you look close, look at all those little dots. That's a scale. They don't even move as adults. They're the original couch potato, but they're a tree potato, I guess. Um, and they, as when lilacs are in bloom, the eggs are gonna start hatching that are underneath the scale of their now dead mom. And the little crawlers are gonna scurry around, find a place to feed, and they'll suck the sap out of the tree and the tree can die back. And so we're coming up to a time period to treat, probably in about another week in much of the state or sometime during this weekend. 
And I, I just have one active ingredient mentioned up here. And I will say this is really for commercial applicators. If you really want to have good control of a lot of our tree pests, you want to hire someone. And this can be sprayed on the bark. It can be injected in the soil. It can even be injected into the tree uh, to help kill these scales and reduce the population from actually harming the plant. Pier just has a huge outbreak as well as Rapid City. There's a lot of ash that are declining in those towns. Nothing to do with emerald ash borer. Winter, oh my goodness. Winter desiccation on arborvitaes. If I had a dollar for every one of these I've looked at, I could probably retire now with Paul. Uh, but again, this is winter desiccation injuries. They've just dried out. Shear it away. If the plant recovers fine, if it doesn't, you're going to replace it, I'm afraid. And just a couple of other things that we're getting to the end. Now is the time to be out treating your Colorado spruce for needle cast diseases. A lot of our spruce, the reason they're losing the lower branches is due to two, one of two needle cast diseases, occasionally both. Stigmania needle cast or rhizosphere needle cast. And I've listed down there some common active ingredients. And you can buy these for homeowners as well. There's homeowner formulations for this. You need to spray the lower third of the spruce tree. Uh, but these are the most common needle cast diseases. But you need to be spraying now because these fungicides protect the new growth as they come out. They really don't do anything once the needles harden. Uh, once they're infected, it's too late. And that's why we call it needle cast. The needles are cast. And then finally, for all of you that had a spruce come down in Eastern South Dakota, and I'm still cleaning them up on campus and out at the gardens, look at this as an opportunity to plant something other than a spruce. And my two favorites, Douglas fir, Pseudosuga menziesii, you gotta love the name. There's a large one out by Oldham. Look at the size of that tree and look at the spruce behind it. So you get an idea of the scale. Doesn't have anywhere near the pest problems that spruce do. Soft needles aren't gonna hurt you when you touch them. I think it's a great choice and might be a good time to consider that. Or my last slide, uh, Siberian larch. It'll tolerate, I don't care how cold it gets, it'll live. Seems to take our heat too and our drought. Uh, I love them. Beautiful tree. I know it's a hard sell. Why? Because in the wintertime, it's a large, it drops its needles. So yes, during the winter, it looks like a dead spruce. I'll, I'll admit that. But it's a great tree otherwise. And by the way, someone mentioned it. What else happens when lilacs are in bloom? Oh yeah, morels. And with those rains we've got, yes, the morels are out. I will not tell you where. But yes, Good picking right now, but a reminder, if you're going to go out and pick mushrooms, the first time you do it, go with someone that knows their mushrooms. Don't eat anything you can't, you don't know what it is. Good advice. All right, so that's it for me. I'll turn it back to uh, Rhoda to wrap us up for another fun evening of the Garden Hour. Thanks, right. everybody. And just a quick reminder, that uh, if you did not get your question answered today, that uh, you can uh, contact the Extension Garden Hotline. Uh, the numbers that, that uh, have been in the chat or uh, up here on the screen or go to SDSC or go to extension.sdstate.edu and uh, click on the garden and yard and you will find Many kinds of information there, including the link to the to the hotline. I want to thank our panelists tonight, uh, Paul and Christine and John. Um, thank you for for your time and and for the information that you've shared and and the beautiful pictures. And I also want to thank our audience uh, tonight for joining us. We invite you to come back uh, next week at the same time. And you can also find the recordings of each Garden Hotline episode online at the Extension website, or you can go to YouTube and, and look for Garden Hour. Uh, 
So if you missed something tonight and you said, I didn't get that written down, you can go back and look. Or if you saw something that you really want to share with a friend, you can share the information and, and uh, have them see it for themselves. With that, I wish you all a good week, and we will see you next week.